There's an old saying that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Elected majorities in this country are pretty powerful. How susceptible are they and those democratically elected at all levels to the slippery slope of corruption? With us now to consider that, we welcome in Kingston, Ontario, Dr. Jane Philpott, former federal cabinet minister who resigned on a point of principle. She's now Dean of the Queen's University Faculty of Health Sciences. In the St. Lawrence Market area of the provincial capital, James Cohen, Executive Director of Transparency International Canada, and from the downtown core, Robert Benzie, Queen's Park Bureau Chief for the Toronto Star. And it's great to have you three back on our airwaves again. I just wanna start by putting this up here. Here's a chart. Uh, James, these are your numbers. Transparency International ranks Canada 11th out of more than 180 plus countries in the world. And here's who's on the list ahead of Canada. New Zealand, Denmark, Finland, Switzerland, Singapore, Sweden, Norway, Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Germany. Okay, James, to you first. 11th out of more than 180 sounds pretty good, is it? All things considered, it is still good for Canada to be at that point. But when we look at the fact that Canada used to be in a top 10 position, uh, pretty much since the beginning of the Corruption Perception Index when it started in the mid-90s, uh, we've taken a spill in the last couple of years. Uh, we first dropped out of the top 10 in 2019, and we stumbled full four points uh, within the CPI, dropping to 12th place. And it wasn't just a matter of in 2019, that's when all corruption hit. We'd actually been sliding for a couple of years. So one off, if you just look at 2020, yeah, not bad. We could be a bit better. We, of course, Canada wants to keep its reputation. But if you look over the last couple of years, uh, there's flags that we've got a problem. Well, let me follow up with Jane Philpott on that, because uh, Dr. Philpott, you sat at the cabinet table for a while. And I wonder how much genuine corruption you ran into during your time in public life. Well, uh, it's a, a great question. Uh, the corruption doesn't happen around the cabinet table. Um, the risks happen in uh, silent, spoken uh, corners. Uh, it's, you know, I think, uh, obviously, as uh, James has already indicated, Canada has a, a long, strong history of doing quite well and trying to reduce the risk of corruption in government. Uh, but Corruption, by its very definition, uh, is uh, it's done somewhat behind the scenes, and the risks of uh, the the possibility that government will be influenced uh, for in inappropriate um, decision making uh, is something that uh, is not out in the open. And I think that you know we saw some reasons why Canada's ranking slipped in 2019 was certainly associated with a recognition that there had been attempted political interference on the part of a large Canadian company. And uh, those things are something that we have to keep our eye on because it's uh, very important for us to protect the security of our democracy. You're referring, of course, to the SNC-Lavalin situation, which bedeviled the federal government for quite a long while. But I want to I want to make sure I understand the distinction here. You referenced a moment ago political interference. Is that the same thing as corruption? Because I bet there are people watching us right now who, when they think corruption, they're thinking, you know, fingers in the cookie jar. They're thinking people stealing and and putting money from the treasury in their back pockets. How are you defining corruption? Well, I suspect that somebody like James, who makes this his full-time job, is probably better at giving you a definition. But, uh, you know, corruption, in, in my mind, is when government makes uh, decisions on the basis of motivations other than the the best public interest. Uh, and so if in the case of uh, making a legal decision or a uh, criminal court decision on the basis of uh, benefiting somebody either by increasing their power or increase, increasing their profits, uh, those are not the reasons that governments are supposed to be making decisions. They uh, always need to have the best interest of the Canadian public uh, at heart and following the rule of law. And so, you know, that would be a, a simple uh, layman's definition, I would say, is that uh, corruption is when decisions are made for the wrong reasons. Robert, over to you for, for a, a sort of a look down the corridors of Queen's Park. How much is the issue of genuine corruption a subject of concern at the provincial legislature? 
Well, I mean, it's always a concern, Steve, but the problem that I have is that when is when po politicians use the word corruption to to uh, to d dub things that may not actually be corrupt. I mean, we saw this a lot with the so-called gas plants scandal in Ontario when it was never clear to me that there was any corruption there. It was you, you might have argued that there was political meddling, but it wasn't the kind of corruption where, uh, you, you know, envelopes of cash were passed along and, and somebody benefited because of the decision that was made in government. So I think that's it's very important because the work that James's group is doing is very important. And, and, and it's important for Canadians to recognize that we are not above uh, unseemly things like the SNC-Lavalin affair, which, uh, you know, and as Dr. Philpott uh, cited, was a, was a case that really uh, it wasn't necessarily a, a corruption at the cabinet table, but there were decisions that were being made that were of great concern. And this is where I, I believe that one of the great um, uh, fighters against corruption is a free press. I mean, if it wasn't for my friend Bob Fight from the Globe and Mail, I'm not sure that the SNC-Lavalin affair would have evolved the way that it did. So I think that that we in, in the media, Steve, have a role to play in putting a magnifying glass uh, on what's happening in government. No, for sure. There's a reason why the media are mentioned in the Constitution of Canada and in the United States, obviously, uh, in their Bill of Rights. But James, I, I, I do want to really hammer down on this issue of, of corruption versus acting not in the public interest. Mm -hmm. We've had two examples already on this program where we've talked about the gas plant scandal that happened under the Dalton McGuinty years and, of course, the SNC-Lavalin scandal in the Justin Trudeau years. In neither case is any politician alleged to have put money in their back pockets or taken bribes or anything like that. The question is, did they act in the public's interest or in their party's partisan interests? Well, we know it's the latter and not the former. So in your view, do those examples rise to the level of calling them corruption? Right. So I'd agree that there's room to muddy the waters on the definition. So the most basic definition that Transparency International uses is that corruption is the abuse of private power for person or of public office for personal gain. And that can even be too narrow because it implies people thinking about, oh, I, I took the money for myself or a bag of cash. But personal gain can be things like the continuation of power or even enabling your network to stay in power. So it's not just uh, the, the envelopes uh, trading hands. It can be, you know, I'll pass a bill for you now versus keeping and then I'll make sure to keep you in power later. Uh, things to that nature. So there is kind of skirting up to the line on ethics and then there's blatantly breaching it as well into once we get into a criminal code matter um so it is it can be politicized the word and it can be used to just throw out or it can be thrown out to just describe a policy people don't like but and that's where we get into is public interest is working in public interest how do you define that based on whose public interest uh but once we get into the idea of somebody did use their public office to benefit themselves financially, benefit their friends financially, benefit the furthering of their career, benefit their network, that's when we get into corruption. Well, I, I really got to push back on that. And Jane, I'm going to do it with you because, you know, the notion that two politicians go into a private office and say, if you support my bill, I'll support your bill. And if my bill gets passed, it'll help my political career and my network. And if your bill gets passed, it'll help your political career and your network. The bills may both be in the public interest, but are we? they're certainly in the partisan interests of those politicians. But are we saying that's a corrupt private undertaking? Well, you're uh, you're pushing us hard there, uh, Steve. But, uh, you know, I think um, the example that you give I, again, I, I'm not sure that we're going to necessarily be able to draw a, a very rigid line, but because of course there are negotiations that happen and people talk about you know what it will take to support uh, a bill, uh, but uh, you know in those cases has somebody used their office to actually be able to uh, make their 
interests better, whether it's their political interests, um, whether there's a profit motive uh, involved, or the the uh, uh, either the gaining or retaining of power in those cases. And I think the passing of of bills and having negotiations is is part of uh, part of what Paul is is involved in politics. And then the, that example that you uh, described, I don't think that that would meet the level of corruption. Um, uh, but uh, you know, I I think you know the there are going to be much more blatant examples. And the case of the attempted interference uh, with a, a criminal court decision and asking a Paul uh, a um, the attorney general to to interfere was you know crossing the line. Certainly, that's the way that it was perceived in my mind that it it crossed the ethical line of uh, people using uh, their political power to uh, be able to interfere with uh, uh, with the judiciary and with the judici the uh, judicial branch of government. And so, um, I I think every day politicians have to decide uh, whether or not something crosses the line. And in that case, it clearly did. Well, one thing we do know for sure is that we know where the public is on this. And uh, Rob, I'll get you to comment on these numbers after we put them up. Tony Burke, if you could. And for those listening on podcast, I'll read these out in some detail. Uh, this is Public Square, Morrow Blue, back in the end of March of this year, doing some polling on a bunch of questions. And 77% agreed with the notion that political parties serve their own interests. 71% of those surveyed are suspicious of political power, and 69% agree that politics has always been nasty and corrupt. Now, Robert, you spent a lot of time at Queen's Park. You know a lot of politicians. You've met hundreds, if not thousands, over the years. Do those numbers reflect the people you know and talk to and interview and investigate, et cetera? No, I think that that's a perverted view of, of uh, it's a perception. And I, I look, I think you could probably ask people at any given time if they thought uh, pol politicians were in it for themselves, uh, regardless of which power party was in power, regardless of the of the time frame, and those numbers would be quite high. Um, I mean, there's not a lot of faith in lots of public institutions, uh, including journalism, frankly, unfortunately. So I, I'm not I'm not sure I read too much into that because I was actually speaking to Steve with a pollster about this yesterday because we were talking about how there, you know, people do believe that government uh, that uh, governments are bad and 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 venal and all political parties are doing awful things, and yet with things like vaccination rates, we see that people are following the lead of the governments in Canada and saying. They're, they're, they're unquestioning almost and saying, yes, we're going to go get vaccinated, which is a good thing. We're in a public health crisis and people are listening to their governments and following the advice of their governments and doing what their governments want them to do. Yet at the same time, they're saying, you know, to each other or to pollsters, oh, we all oh, we think political parties are all in it for themselves and, and, and they're all greed heads and, and so on. I have known, as you say, Steve, as you have, you've even known more politicians than I have. And I could count on one hand uh, of the hundreds I've known. I, that I would say we're not in politics for the right reasons, that we're really only in it for their own personal gain. It's very, very few. I mean, it's it's not a well-paying job, particularly in Canada. Uh, and and it's, it's a thankless job in many ways, being an MPP or being an MP, uh, even a cabinet minister, even a leader or, or a, a premier or prime minister. It's not the kind of fun uh, free-for-all that, that some people might imagine it to be. And I, I think it's a real shame that people sort of cast that aspersion on all polit all politicians and say look they're all they're all corrupt they're all in it for themselves i you know they're most of them really aren't the vast majority and, and dr Philbo, i'm sure could attest to it that the most of them are decent people who are in it for the right reasons and want to be there for public service well before i give dr philpott a chance to comment on that james i i am interested in your view of those numbers because for a country that's 11th in the world on the corruption scale ahead of 170 plus other countries, do you find those numbers kind of high? No, they're not surprising. We ran a similar survey, uh, just focusing on Western Canada, and we found roughly the same numbers as well. Um, it comes a little bit back to the question of how do you define corruption? And we asked people, uh, or Canadians in Western Canada, what their definition was. And it does run the gamut from the TI definition all the way to follow the Bible. Um, so uh, sometimes there is the idea that if there's a policy I don't like, it, it must have been done corruptly. Now that said, it also doesn't take a lot to ruin people's trust, and it takes a lot to build it back in, or build that trust back up. 
And so if there are scandals that are brought up, there are misappropriations that are done. And it, it's a requirement of civil society and journalism to bring that to public eye so that no one ever gets tempted by lack of oversight. Uh, but when they do come out, it does take a long time for the public to regain trust. And so politicians should never take that for granted of, but I know I'm doing uh, something for the public good. It's, they've got to also comment to their colleagues and to you know, the public institutions that we all have to keep up the status, be transparent, be, tra be accountable, show integrity, why we should keep public trust. And that's really important. Well, I am going to go to Jane Philpott on this because um, you and I were both alive at a time in this province when if you wanted to get a job at the LCBO, you had to know somebody in the Tory government who would give you that job as a patronage appointment to say, thank you for supporting your progressive conservative party. Now, we don't live in that kind of a world anymore. Those jobs have been professionalized and so on. But in your travels around politics, how much of that approach or style still goes on and do you consider that corruption in politics well again you're getting us into this uh, question of the f the fine line of uh, of when corruption starts or stops versus what are the public's expectations as to how governments should run and on on what basis should privileges be granted so you know i the speaking of great journalism that uh, has been done. I think there's been some interesting uh, work done, um, again, by some of the folks at the, the Globe who did work on judicial appointments recently uh, and looking at, you know, what kind of conversations take place behind the scenes. That's another sort of classic space where, where uh, there's, uh, there's a potential to reward people's friends. Um, I think we've come a long way and I certainly saw lots of good progress in terms of what the processes are to make sure that uh, pay, that, that appointments are made that there's a, a transparent and open process that's fair and, and, and uh, everybody is eligible. Um, I think you know people would be fooling themselves to uh, imagine that there still aren't um, decisions that are made as to who gets what job uh, at various uh, orders of government and this is not any particular party or any particular type of government based on you know who's gonna who's gonna be easy to work with. Um, it might be something that's as simple as that, not just about uh, um, a financial benefit or a political benefit. Um, is that corruption? I, I'm not sure that it necessarily meets the bar, but what it does do is feed into those numbers that you're talking about. It feeds into the public's disappointment, the public's cynicism around how decisions are made, uh, because, uh, you know, the people that are get the potentially powerful jobs um, often are people that have said friendly things about governments. No, fair enough. And Robert, I want to follow up with you on that. Um, let me put it this way. You know, patronage, look at patronage is a part of democracy. It's a part of politics. It's always been, it's always going to be. I, I never got particularly fussed about patronage when somebody was qualified to be appointed to a position that they could do. What I think bothers people is when people who have no qualifications for a particular gig but get it anyway because they happen to wear the right party stripe, that may be a problem. So on that latter point, how much of that still goes on in public life in this country? Well, patronage appointments have been the bane of, uh, of governments for forever in this country. And journalists love them because we pour over them and, and point to the cynicism and and. Here at Queen's Park, uh, Steve, you and I have talked about this many times before. Uh, in 2019, Doug Ford's chief of staff had to resign suddenly after he uh, in, uh, made uh, two patronage appointments to uh, to be a consul general in London, England, and a consul general or an Ontario agent general, sorry, in London, England, and in one in New York, because those were deemed to be friends of his. Um, and they were, one was a, actually a family member, a cousin of his wife. And, and the other was a, was a friend of, of one of his kids from the, la, la, the lacrosse team, uh, in New York. And this, I mean, that was a scandal that the premier Doug Ford doesn't, wasn't going to weather. I mean, the appointments were made on a Thursday on the same day as a major, a major cabinet shuffle. They were kind of shoved out the door, uh, at the end of the day as these things happen. And, uh, and then the next day, the uh, chief of staff was, uh, was resigning. And I think that that was a situation that told us <laughs> that the government does not have a high tolerance for that kind of, 
uh, patronage. I don't think that's corruption. I, I think uh, Dr. Popart is correct. It's you have to be very, very careful uh, of, of the line between patronage and corruption. But the thing is, in the, in the public's mind, uh, it's blurred. And I think that people do pay, play close, pay close scrutiny to um, scrutiny to uh, patronage appointments because they're looking for things that they believe to be corrupt. But that same day that the that the Tories made those appointments, a former Tory president got an agent general job in um, in uh, Dallas and another uh, another liberal appoint a liberal who was close to the Ford family got an appointment uh, in, in Chicago so those and and there wasn't as much outrage over those because those people were deemed to be qualified well okay let me pick up on that with Jane Philpot in your time in public life how often did you see somebody who was manifestly unfit to serve in the position to which they were being appointed given a patronage job because I'll grant you in that case that's pretty undefensible indefensible i i believe that's that's pretty rare these days um you know i i can't uh, off the top of my head think of a specific example where i would say you know someone was was blatantly uh, incompetent at what they were being asked to do i think we are getting better uh in that regard in terms of making sure that people are qualified and you know that's why these kinds of appointments um leave leave room for people to uh, be able to have choices is because sometimes there are multiple in, in fact large numbers of people who might be qualified there's a lot of people who want to be a senator you know that's a, a fairly popular thing to to uh to look to and there are you know thousands of canadians who uh, might have qualifications that would make them to be excellent senators and so you're left with sometimes challenging choices to say are we putting the people uh are we choosing people on the basis of their merit or are we choosing them on the basis of all of the other potential metrics uh that one could uh, use to be able to decide who's the best candidate. James, would you agree that the appointments process, regardless of level of government, is better today than it was, say, 25 years ago? I uh, haven't done the actual tracking on the process, but just to agree that, you know, I, th I think the more scrutiny that comes into the process and the more justification uh, for a position, even if somebody was close to a political party, as everyone has noted so far, we all want to know that for our taxpayer money, that person at least has the qualifications, even if it, it could be possible that they were part of the political party. And you know, everyone always says, if only government was run like business, well, in the business, you'd appoint a lot of your friends, uh, but this is public funds. And even if it is a friend, declare a potential conflict of interest in the hiring process and show that the person is qualified. Let me read something here now from the Center for the Study of Corruption uh, as we sort of take our lens and widen out and look at the broader world. Historical and anthropological research into corruption has shown how ideas on corruption, integrity, and indeed public morality as such develop in their own relevant environment of time and place. After all, various acts that were once perfectly acceptable, consider 18th century sale of public office or gift giving practices, are these days generally condemned. Similarly, what is not corrupt in one context can easily be considered at least questionable in another. This implies that rather than stressing universal rules and regulations, anti-corruption measures should be particularistic in nature and acknowledge historical, cultural, and temporal variants. Simply put, in order to adopt effective policy, it is essential to acknowledge that different contexts can simply have different values and norms of good governance. Jane Philpott, I want to go back to you on this because you have traveled widely. You've uh, lived and worked in Africa. You have seen different forms of governance up close, different standards. Is this writer correct when he says that in different contexts, we may think of one thing in one place as corrupt, but in another place, it's kind of the cost of doing business? Okay, so again, you're putting us on a slippery slope around this, the idea of the cost of doing business, because, you know, certainly when I made my decision uh, of uh, stepping down from cabinet on the matter of principle, uh, there were lots of people who accused me of not understanding that that's the cost of doing business. And, um, you know, I would argue that they should study uh, a little bit uh, about the, um, the root roots of that story, particularly as it relates to uh, corruption in Libya, for example. So, 
uh, you know, the cost of doing business, I don't buy as an argument. What I will say to you is, of course, there are cultural differences. I mean, the reason that this mattered so much to me and that uh, interference in, in, uh, uh, in the matters of law was so important to me is because I did live for a decade of my life in the country of Niger uh, in the 1990s and haven't lived there um, uh, consistently since late, the late 90s. And uh, so things hopefully, uh, well, I won't comment on politics of, of Niger, but I can tell you um, we lived in a country where decisions were made on the basis of handing over cash. Uh, so, you know, sometimes it was just simple things like getting your goods out of customs or, you know, getting past a checkpoint, but that was accepted as a norm. But that absolutely doesn't mean that it was ever good or if it was desir or, or, or desirable. So yes, there are cultural differences in what's accepted, but at the end of the day, you know, corruption is corruption. And, you know, thankfully with the increasing democratization of countries, ideally uh, a lowering of corruption and increasing of transparency happens uh, in that case, uh, but um, it doesn't necessarily change the definition. James, I'll follow up with you on that because I guess one of the things this article is raising is the notion that we really probably can't expect every other country in the world to adhere to the so-called, you know, Western democratic standards of what constitutes corruption versus what constitutes the cost of doing business. I take Dr. Philpott's point on the latter point, but I mean, is it reasonable to expect every country to live up to the standards of, of Canadian democracy as it relates to corruption? So there's a couple of things coming from that article and I read the full thing and I get the author's point, but I agree with Dr. Philpott. It can easily get you into that idea of, oh, some cultures just are corrupt and that's the way they like it, which I completely and utterly reject. Um, I have colleagues in Transparency International working all over the world uh, who put their lives in far more danger than I put mine in here in Toronto so that they can rid their country of corruption. Um, that said, there are different governance systems. Um, and within those systems, you then ask, is it transparent, is it accountable, and does it have integrity? Nobody likes to be called corrupt or even, you know, Transparency International, having gone into meeting rooms with businesses and governments around the world, people get their back up against the wall pretty quickly because uh, it's a very dirty word. Um, people do like the word integrity. So, for example, one time I was in Burundi uh, as part of a TI delegation, and we were talking to police officers in Burundi, and we showed them the East African Corruption uh, Index put up by our, our colleagues at TI Kenya, and they saw that the Burundian police service was ranked as more corrupt than the Kenyan police service. And they all scoffed at that, saying, no, 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 we've all been to Kenya. We know how corrupt their police are. We've got problems, but we're not that bad. So, okay, Burundi is not going to be Norway overnight, but obviously there's a standard. And this idea that they just like corruption, no, it's still a dirty word. Uh, and they don't want it. It's just a matter of can Westerners, can Canadians or any other people take our codes of anti-corruption, go to another country and just enforce them without observing what are the economic and political circumstances that brought people to certain corruption. I mean, whenever we say some cultures just like corruption, it often negates the role that Westerners play in enabling that corruption for generations and building in those systems. So yes, time and context, very important, but look at the whole history of how a situation got there. Robert, you're the member of the fourth estate among this group here, so I'm gonna put this to you because this was a notoriously controversial moment in Canadian journalistic history. Ten years ago, Maclean's Magazine put the province of Quebec on its cover and called it the most corrupt province in Canada. Um, Quebec was obviously outraged about it, but I wonder if it's a, is, is it a, a good reminder about how carefully members of the media have to be when they toss around that word? Yeah, no, certainly it, it is. But uh, as I recall from that article, which I believe uh, Marty Patrickwin wrote, was, it was a pretty exhaustively researched piece. Uh, some province has to be considered the most corrupt in, pro in Canada. So if it's not Quebec, which is it? Is it Ontario? Is it, is it New Brunswick? So I think, yes, we have to be very careful when we throw those terms around. But when you have a lot of evidence of corrupt incidents, whether it's uh, the construction contracts that you had in Quebec with bridges collapsing and, and other things like that, then you have, you have some evidence. And, and, and I, I thought McLean's was bold to do that at the time. 
and I know they took a lot of heat for it, but just because it, they took a lot of heat doesn't mean it wasn't accurate. Well, and there was the sponsorship scandal too, in which two businessmen and a public servant went to jail over that, although I note no politicians. Um, okay, Jane Philpott, I got to ask you, in your time in public life, did anybody approach you to do anything illegal or ill-advised or unethical or let's call it corrupt? Did you run into any of that? I did not run into that from the point of view of uh, anyone overtly in government asking me to do anything that was ill-advised. Uh, you get a lot of Canadians who want you to make decisions that would be ill-advised, like uh, appointing them. So it's not an uncommon thing for a cabinet minister to get letters of request from people who should know better saying, hey, can you get me this, uh, this job or that? So uh, requests come from members of the public to see if you can influence things you know can you can you uh, get uh, extra benefits for my family members can you move them up the line for uh, getting their uh, immigration status uh, clarified faster um, those are the kinds of things that uh, politicians I think encounter quite frequently um, but I'm I'm happy to say that I was not overtly uh, asked in any way by uh, any of my fellow politicians to do something that was uh, was corrupt Good to know. Jane Philpott, James Cohen, Robert Benzi. Great to have the three of you on TVO tonight. Take care, everybody. Can I see Thank you? you? Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.